Revolutionaries, and the book My Ishmael by Daniel Quinn. You want to know how the world would be if you started living a different way. Now you have a better idea of what a different way would be for. I told you that you had to stop thinking of giving up things and be more demanding, but I don't think you understood what I meant. No, I didn't, not really, but I thought I did. But now you really understand. You fell apart when you finally realized that I would actually listen to your demands, that I actually wanted to hear your demands, that you even deserved to have your demands met. Yes, that's right. That's how we'll design a world for you, Julie, by listening to your demands. What is it you want? What would you die to have? Wow, I said. That's quite a question. I want a place to be where I'm not always saying, I've got to get out of here, I've got to get out of here, I've got to get out of here, I've got to get out of here. You and the Jeffreys of the world need a cultural space of your own. Yeah, that's right. Cultural space is a necessary geographic space. The kids who live on the streets of Seattle and places like that aren't looking for a thousand acres of their own. They're perfectly happy to share your domain, and in fact would probably starve to death if they had to live in a separate domain of their own. They're saying, look, we're content to live on, our, on what the rest of you throw away. Why can't you just let us do that? Give us enough room to be scavengers. We'll be the tribe of crow. You don't kill the crows that are killing, taking care of your road kills, do you? If you kill the crows, then you have to scrape off the road kills yourselves. Let the crows do it. They're not taking any, anything you want, so what's the problem with crows? We're not taking anything you want either, so what's the problem with us? That actually sounds pretty neat. Not that it'll ever happen. But what about you, Julie? What would you like to belong? Would you like to belong to the tribe of crow? Not especially, to be honest. Well, why should you? There's no one right way for people to live. But suppose the people of Seattle actually said, let's try this. Instead of fighting these kids and trying to change these kids and making life hell for these kids, let's give them a hand. Let's give them a hand to become the tribe of crow. What's the worst that could happen? That would be terrific. And if you were people like that in Seattle, people willing to take a risk like that, where would you want to live if you were looking around for a place to live? I'd want to live in Seattle. Could be an interesting place, Julie place where people try things. Ishmael fell silent for several minutes and had the feeling he, he'd sort of lost his place. Finally, he went on. No matter how thorough I think I've been at this stage, students say to me, yes, but what are we actually supposed to do? And I say to them, you takers pride yourself on being inventive, don't you? Well, be inventive. But this doesn't seem to do much good, does it? I didn't know whether he was talking to himself or me, but I just went on sitting there and listening. Tell me about being inventive, Julie. What do you mean? When your greatest when was your greatest period of inventiveness? The greatest period of inventiveness in human history. I'd have to say this was. Is. This is it. The period of the Industrial Re Revolution? That's right. How did it work? What do you mean? Your greatest task in the decades ahead is to be inventive. Not for machines, but for yourself. Does that make sense to you? Yes then maybe there are some things we can learn about inventiveness from the greatest outpouring of inventiveness in human history. Does that sound plausible? Yes, absolutely. So once again, how did it work? Indef industrial Revolution? God, I don't know. Did the Industrial Revolution Army move into the capital and seize the reins of power? Did it round up the royal family and guillotine them? No. Then how did it work? God. Are you asking me about cartels and monopolies? No, nothing of the sort. I'm not looking into money. I'm looking into inventiveness. Try it this way, Julie. How did the Industrial Revolution start? Oh, okay. I remember that. It's all I do remember. James Watt, the steam engine, 1700 and something. Excellent, Julie. James Watt, the steam engine, 1700 and something. James Watt is often credited with inventing the steam engine that started it all. But this is a misleading simplification that misses the whole point of this revolution. James Watt in 1763 merely improved on an engine designed in 1712 by Thomas Newcomen, who had merely improved on an engine designed in 1702 by Thomas Savory, who doubtlessly knew the engine described in 1663 by Edward Somerset, which was only a variation of Salomon de Caux's 1615 steam fountain, which is in fact very like a device described 30, 13 years earlier by Guillemin Battista della Porta, who was the first to make any significant use of steam power since the time of Hero of Alexander, 
in the first century of the Christian era. This is an excellent demonstration of how industrial revolution worked, but I don't imagine you see it quite yet. So I'll give you another example. Steam engines wouldn't have much utility without coked coal, which is flameless and smokeless. The coking of coal produces coal gas, which originally was simply vented as worthless. But by the 1790s, it was beginning to be burned in factories, both to run equipment and to produce light. But coking coal to produce coal gas generated much another waste product, coal tar, an assy, smelly sludge that was especially difficult to get rid of. German chemists reasoned that it was foolish to work to get rid of it when there might be something useful to do with it. Distilling coal tar then produced kerosene, a new fuel, and creosote, a tarry substance that was found to be a wonderful wood preservative. Since creosote kept wood from rotting, it seemed reasonable to suppose that similar results might be obtained from other coal tar derivatives. In one such experiment, carbolic acid was used to inhibit pure putrefaction in sewage. Hearing of this effect of the, mater of the material in 1865, the English surgeon Joseph Lister wondered if it might prevent purification in human flesh wounds, which at that time made all surgery life-threatening. It did. Still another derivative was carbon black, the residue left by the smoke of burned coal tar. This found one use in a kind of carbon paper invented by Cyrus Dalkin in 1823. It found another use when Thomas Edison discovered that he could amplify telephonic sound by inserting a pellet of carbon black into the receiver. Ishmael looked at me hopefully. I told him car to coal tar was a lot more useful than I imagined. I'm sorry, I added. I know I'm missing the point. You've asked me what to do, Julie, and I've given one blanket directive. Be inventive. Now, I'm trying to show you what it means to be inventive. I'm trying to show you how the greatest period of human inventiveness worked. The Industrial Revolution was a product of a million small beginnings, a million great little ideas, a million modest innovations and improvements over previous inventions. These millions aren't exaggerations, I think. Over a period of 300 years, hundreds of thousands of you, acting almost exclusively from motives of self-interest, have transformed the human world by broadcasting ideas and discoveries, and furthering these ideas and discoveries by taking them step by step to new ideas and discoveries. I know what, I know that there are Luddite Puritans among you who think that the Industrial Revolution is the work of the devil, but I'm certainly not one of them, Julie, partly because it didn't proceed according to any theoretical design, and Industrial Revolution was not a utopian undertaking. Unlike the things of your schools, your prisons, your courts, your government structures, it didn't depend on people being better than they are. In fact, it depended on people being just what they've always been. Give them gaslight, and they'll abandon candles. Give them electric light, and they'll abandon gaslight. Offer them shoes that are attractive and comfortable, and they'll abandon shoes that are ugly and uncomfortable. Offer them electric sewing machines, and they'll abandon foot-driven sewing machines. Offer them color televisions and they'll abandon black and white televisions. It's tremendously important to notice that the wealth of human inventiveness that was generated by the Industrial Revolution was broadcast and not con concentrated into the hands of a privileged few. I'm not referring to the products that were turned out, but rather to the intellectual wealth that was generated. No one could lock up either the inventiveness process itself or in the discoveries it produced. Every time some new device or process came out, everyone was free to say, I can do something with that. Everyone was free to say, I can take this idea and build on it. Everyone was free to say, I can use this idea in a way its inventor never dreamed of. Well, I told him. It certainly never occurred to me to think of the Industrial Revolution that way. It's important to note that I'm not pro proposing it as a candidate for sanctification. I'm not recommending its goal or its saint. saint or its shameful features, its relentless marital materialism, its appalling wastefulness, its enormous appetite for irreplaceable resources, its readiness to flow wherever greed took it. I'm recommending only its mode of operation, which released the greatest and most democratic outpouring of human creativity in human history. Far from th thinking about giving up things, You've got to be thinking now about releasing just such another outpouring of human creativity, one that is not directed toward turning out product wealth, but rather turning out the kind of wealth you threw away to make yourselves the rulers of, rulers of the world and now so desperately crave. Give me an example, Ishmael. Give me an example. The Seattle project that we just discussed is an example. This would be the equivalent of Solomon de Cox's 
1615 Steam Fountain, Julie. Now the last word, just the beginning. People in Los Angeles will look at their experiment and say, yes, that's not bad, but we can do something better here. And people in Detroit would look at Los Angeles' effort and find a different angle of attack to use in their own city. Give me another example. The people of Peoria, Illinois say, look, maybe we could head toward the tribal model of building on the Sals Sodbury Valley School in Farmington, Massachusetts. We could pension off our teachers, close the schools, and open up the city to our children. Let them learn anything they want. We could take that risk. We believe in our kids to do to that extent. This is an experiment that would draw national attention. Everyone would be watching to see how well it worked. I personally have no doubt that it would be tr a tremendous success, provided that they really let the kids follow their noses instead of subverting the project with curricula. But of course, the Peoria model would just be the beginning. Other cities would see ways to enrich it, surpass it. Okay, one more example, please. You know, Julie, healthcare workers aren't universally overjoyed to be part of the money-making machine that healthcare has become in this country. Many actually went into healthcare for entirely different reasons than to get rich. Maybe in Albuquerque, New Mexico, they could get together and take the system to a whole new direction. Maybe it will occur to them that there is already a sort of James Watt in this field, a physician by the name of Patch Adams, who started the Gesundheit Institute, a hospital in Virginia where people are treated free of charge. But maybe they need the additional inspiration of seeing similar things happening elsewhere, things like the Seattle Project and the Peoria Project. This is how the Industrial Revolution worked, Julie. People saw other people figuring out how to make things work and were inspired to try it themselves. I think the biggest obstacle to all these things would be the government. Of course, Julie. That's what governments are there for, to keep good things from happening. But I'm afraid I have to say that if you can't even manage to force your own presumably democratic governments to allow you to do good things for yourself, then you probably z deserve to become extinct. I agree. I've opened the tribal treasury for you, Julie. I've shown you the things you threw away for the sake of making yourselves rulers of the world. The system of wealth based on exchange of energy that is inexhaustible and completely renewable. A system of laws that actually helped people live instead of just punishing them for doing things that people have always done and always will do. An educational system that cost nothing, worked perfectly, and drew people together generationally. There are many other systems worthy of your study here, but you'll find none that encourages people to build creatively off each other's ideas the way you've done during your industrial revolution. There was no prohibition against such creative, creativity in the tribal life, there, but there was also no demand or reward for it. He fell silent for a moment. I opened my mouth to speak, and he held up a hand to stop me. I know you haven't given what I haven't given what you asked for. I'm getting there. You'll just have to be patient and let me get there my own way. I batted my eyelashes and held my peace. Revolutionaries from Daniel Quinn's My Ishmael. Now the reason I read that is because a gentleman named James J. Lee uh, has held hostages in the Discovery Channel building um, as a as a protest to what the Discovery Channel is doing um, I want everyone to understand that the things that are going on in this book um, are not indicative of what James is doing um, I've had some contact with James before, um, and his ideas are much like mine and the other people uh, who have been inspired by Daniel Quinn, but what we're really hungry for is equity and to actually get our demands heard, what, you know, let people hear what we want and allow us to get what we want in our lives so we can provide for a sustainable future for our children and for the world. So this is, I just want to make this video real quick so people know what he's wanting them to broadcast and I'll make a follow-up video based on whatever comments I get on this. Take care.